three structural isomers with molecular formula C6H14, I used to investigate the effect of branching on the physical properties of hydrocarbons. So I think uh, just that statement answers most of our questions uh, because we know that we are investigating the effect of branching on the physical properties. So we already have our independent and dependent variable in a way. But anyway, stories. 3.1, define the term melting point. So melting point is the temperature at which the solid and the liquid phases of a substance are at equilibrium. The temperature at which the solid and liquid phases of a substance are at equilibrium. That is 3.1. Let's take a look at 3.2. 3.2, write out the independent variable for investigation 1. Write on the independent variable for investigation one. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So investigation one. Obviously, we are investigating the effect of branching. And then in our case, the physical property happens to be melting point. So is branching the independent variable or is melting point the independent variable? We have to define what we mean when we say independent variable or what it means to us when we answer these questions. So what it means to us when we answer these questions? Uh, the dependent variable is what we are measuring, and the independent variable is what we are willingly changing, while the control variable is what is the same uh, with the regards to those different compounds, what is similar between those compounds. It can be functional group, it can be molecular formula, so on and so on. So independent variable, what is it that we are willingly changing? We are changing the branching because in this investigation, we're investigating the effect of branching on physical properties. So the answer to 3.2 is branching. Branching is our independent variable because that is what we are willingly changing in order to measure uh, its effect on physical properties. 3.2, what about... 3.3. Explain why these three organic compounds are called structural isomer. So structural isomer is same molecular formula but different structures. As you can see, uh, well, it is even said to us that three structural isomers with the molecular formula C6H14. So they have the same molecular formula. They have the same molecular formula, which is C16, H14. So same molecular uh, formula, but different structures, but different structures. Now, basically, we're just given uh, the definition of uh, structural isomers here, right? Same molecular formula, but different uh, structures. So that is 3.3. Um, Let's take a look at 3.4. 3.4, uh, write down the type of intermolecular forces that are uh, present between molecules of these isomers. So let's take a look at our compounds A, B, C. A, B, C are hydrocarbons. They only contain hydrogen and carbon. So which intermolecular forces exist between um, in the hydrocarbons? It is London forces. London forces, it is the intermolecular force that exists in hydrocarbon. But in, let's say, for instance, ketone, which intermolecular forces exist in ketone? London forces exist in ketone. Let's look at aldehydes. London exists. Carboxylic acids. London forces exist. So London forces exist in all our homologous series, right? But it's just that uh, alcohol, for instance, it has London force and on top of that hydrogen bonding. But hydrocarbons, we only have London force, right? So when we say that um, alcohol has hydrogen bonding, which is stronger than uh, dipole dipole, yes, it does have hydrogen bonding, but it also has London forces, right? Uh, I just thought that that would be important to note. Uh, that is 3.4. Let's take a look at 3.5. Explain the difference in metal points in melting points between molecules A and B. So let's take a look at A and 
B. Let's take a look at A and B. So A, uh, well, let me just show you something. We have one, two, three, four, five. Then a carbon on the second a carbon. Okay. And then that is A. And then B, we have one, two, um, three. And then let's make this uh, four. Okay, so let's find our longest chain here because it seems like there's a lot going on. Let's take these as our longest chain. If we take that as our longest chain, then we have two branches there. Okay, so take a look at compound A and take a look at compound B. How do they differ? We're supposed to explain the difference in metal points between A and B. You can see that B is more branched. B is more branched. Uh, that is... That should be easy to see that B is more branched, right? Compared to A, B is more branched. It is more spherical. So compound B will have weaker intermolecular forces. We have inter, weaker intermolecular forces. So weaker IMF. And as a consequence of that, less energy, less energy is required. Less energy is required to overcome the intermolecular forces in B. And then as a consequence, it is going to have... Um, okay, what are we basing this on? Are we basing it on investigation 1 or investigation 2? We will still reach the same conclusion. But the question is, should we talk about melting point or should we ever talk about a boiling point? I think we can talk about both, really. So it will have a lower melting point and the lower boiling point compared to A, compared to A, right? If you have weaker intermolecular forces, you have a lower melting point and a lower boiling point, but a higher vapor pressure. Okay, that is 3. Point, um, is that 3.5? Yes, it is. So, carry on, take a look at 3.6. So, 3.6 for investigation 3. Um, okay. In our tables, we don't have in investigation 3 there, but it is totally fine. The vapor pressure uh, measured at 25 degrees Celsius is shown in the table below. Okay, we don't know which is for which. We're just given some numbers. But anyway, stories. Uh, 3.6, the question itself. Using the information of investigation 2 and investigation 3, match the correct vapor pressure with the appropriate molecule, A to C. Write on lattice. A to C below each other with the corresponding vapor pressure next to each other. Okay, and then 3.7, we're supposed to explain that. We're supposed to explain our answer in 3.6. So let's just answer 3.6. Well, I'm going to explain as I answer 3.6. So uh, there's no need for me to write down 3.7 as I'm going to give the, ex uh, the explanation as I write the answers to 3.6. So 3.6, we need to match those vapor pressures to either to A, B, C. Okay, so again, the higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. The higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. So what is the lowest um, vapor pressure here? The lowest vapor pressure is 211, 211. So it means that the compound with the highest boiling point will have this vapor pressure of 211. So let's go ahead and see which compound is that. Uh, it seems to be compound A because it has a boiling point of 60 and B and C have 58 and 50 respectively. So we can say that this is C, okay? And then we're saying that uh, the higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. So it means that the compound with the lowest boiling point should have the highest vapor pressure. So back to our table, C has the lowest boiling point, so it should have the highest vapor pressure. The compound with the lowest vapor pressure should have the highest boiling point. And that is clearly compound A. Compound A has a boiling point of 60. B and C have 58 and 50 respectively. So here, uh, 211, uh, that is compound A as it has the highest um, boiling point. Back to the relationship uh, we know to be true. The higher the boiling point, the lower the vapor pressure. So it means that the compound with the lowest boiling point should have the highest vapor pressure. They're inversely proportional to each other. So 319 is the compound with the lowest boiling point. 
When we go back to our table, it will be easy to see that C should be that compound as it has a boiling point of 50, which is the lowest of the three. So this is compound C. Without doing any further work, it will be easy to see that the one we are left with should be compound B. So there we go.